Well, good morning, Greenwich, and welcome to the Wednesday, August 25th edition of the Basement Academy. I think we're going to be a little long today. There's a pretty robust set of questions I'm going to be asking. And so uh, let's dive right on into our morning psalm, Psalm 115. Not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to your name be the glory because of your love and faithfulness. Why do, do, do the nations say, where is their God? That is, where is Israel's God? Our God is in heaven. He does whatever pleases him. But their idols are silver and gold, made by the hands of men. They have mouths but cannot speak, eyes but they cannot see. They have ears but cannot hear, noses but they cannot smell. They have hands but cannot feel, feet but they cannot walk, nor can they utter a sound with their throats. Those who make them will be like them, and so will all who trust in them. O house of Israel, trust in the Lord. He is their help and shield. O house of Aaron, trust in the Lord. He is their help and shield. You who fear him, trust in the Lord. He is their help and shield. The Lord remembers us and will bless us. He will bless the house of Israel. He will bless the house of Aaron. He will bless those who fear the Lord, both small and great alike. May the Lord make you increase, both you and your children. May you be blessed by the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. The highest heavens belong to the Lord, but the earth he has given to man. It is not the dead who praise the Lord, those who go down to silence. It is we who extol the Lord, both now and forevermore. Praise the Lord. Mm, love this psalm. And so it starts out with a short, I think somewhat almost humorous or sarcastic reflection on the reality of idolatry. So the nation surrounding your nation, where's their God? Because Israel had no God you could see. Because our God is in heaven, right? <laughs> the invisible God. And the nations say, well, look at our gods. You know, we've got this statue and we've got this statue and we've got this statue. And so Baal and Molech and Ashtoreth and Asherah and, and Artemis and all these other pagan gods. They have mouths, but they cannot speak. <laughs> Eyes, but cannot see. Ears, but cannot hear and so on. Statue, things that have been made by men are lifeless, <laughs> Right? They have no life in and of themselves. That comes from God. And so uh, idols, statues, or idolatrous systems of belief, explanatory models and the like, okay? Those who make them will be like them. So will all who trust in them. And so idolatry always involves a lifelessness, in, in inert um, uh, inability to respond. It, there's nothing there. Ultimately, it's a nothing. And so as we continue with uh, critical race theory, I've been talking about how to respond or starting to talk about how to respond to critical race theory. After two weeks of trying to understand it, where it's come from, its cultural context, some of its core um, teachings or concepts, how do we respond to critical race theory. So I'm, I'm gonna give you two, two answers. One, with respect to policies and proposals that are coming from or that are surrounding kind of critical race theory, this should be taught, uh, this kind of action or activity should take place in our schools, on our university campuses, uh, in our organization. So where there are policies and proposals where there's an opportunity to vote or to, to give voice to support for that, do so. Vote as you are led by your conscience. So if it's a school board member or a county supervisor or a U.S. representative or a state senator or a president or whatever, wherever there's an opportunity for civic engagement at the ballot box in some way, engage. 
Okay, so I think that's one way. But those are usually episodic, right? Those happen every, you know, year or two years or four years, right? So that those do not happen frequently. So vote as you are led by your conscience. I'm not going to tell you how to vote. Just if you love it, go for it. You know, if you don't, then then don't don't support it. But the more common response we're going to have is going to be personal conversation, personal discussions with family members, with co-workers, with neighbors, with people, right? It's going to be a conversation with someone who's either advocating for it or not. And so this set of questions is proposed around a conversation with somebody who's advocating for critical race theory in some way. So in my context, our presbytery, that there's a significant advocacy going on for this framework. And I'm, I'm glad for this opportunity because I have not asked these questions of anybody. I'm going to ask them of you or I'm going to present them now. Um, but I think they're helpful. They're certainly helpful for me. So the very, so, so in personal discussions, two things you want to do. You want to affirm and ask, okay? You want to affirm as a Christian, I share a concern for the suffering of our world. I share a concern for injustice. I, I share a concern around the pain of those who have been wronged in, in some way. And so we affirm certain things. We want to we want to build a place of, of things we do agree on before we might engage in conversations where we might disagree with others. And so I think that's always a winning strategy, you know trying to come in through the front door with your hammer in your hand and just to pound away on people for all the stupid things that critical race theory teaches is not going to be productive. You may feel better. You may feel righteous in the way you've expressed yourself. But our goal is not to win arguments. Our goal is to win people. And the people we want to win are those who maybe have fallen under the spell, <laughs> those who have been kind of, I'm enamored of critical race theory and its teaching, particularly maybe Christian people, you know, colleagues, friends, you know, family members um, who are Christian, who have come to think of this as the way it is. So you're affirming as a Christian, I I. I, I wholeheartedly affirm that the image of God is born by every human being, no matter what skin color, custom language, etc. And then you want to ask a bunch of questions. Okay. I think asking questions is better than making statements. The very first question you have to get out the, out, out the door though, is this, is it okay if I ask some questions? So rather than engaging into a, well, I've studied critical race theory and here's what I think it's, if you're talking with someone who advocates for and is supportive of critical race theory, or you suspect that they are, I, I wonder if it's okay if I ask some questions and if they say, no, you know, I, I went to the training and it really was clear to me and I don't think there's any questions we need to ask about that. There's one more question you ask before the conversation's over. Doesn't that concern you that I'm, I can't even ask a question? I, that, I'm, I'm surprised about that. So can I ask some questions? If the answer is no, well, the discussion's over, right? Because there's, it's, it, there's no openness to changing their mind, okay? So, but we ask, doesn't that concern you that critical race theory won't allow any questions to be asked of it? Hmm, you know, that's, so maybe that's the seed you plant and walk away. Assuming they'll say yes. Well, sure. Yeah. Why, why wouldn't you be able to ask questions? Great. Well, I, I'm wondering, and I, I like that language. I'm wondering or I'm curious. And so I, I, I'm curious. I'm wondering, how do we know it actually works? Have we seen it work anywhere? I, I'm not aware of any other nation that's, that's really taught this, or maybe there's an organization. Is there some kind of laboratory, some group of people where what critical race theory teaches has actually brought about what it aspires to. Because um, I think it's a kind of a big approach. And so it wants to dismantle systems. And so are we aware of any country or organization that has been successful at dismantling 
its structures and its systems and survived. And and I'm just, so I'm curious. I, I mean, this is a sidebar now. I don't know of one. So I think we want to ask that question. I mean, how do we know this surgery works? <laughs> you know, a doctor, have you ever performed the surgery? No, but I, I, I heard it works. Well, I'm, you know, how do we know this engineering structure works? Well, I, I drew it up on the, you know, on the, the drafting board and I think it'll work. So, so I think that's a pretty basic question. How do we know this stuff works? Okay. And they may say, well, I don't know that we do know it works or, you know, I, I think it'll work. So that, so that may be the only question you need to help somebody go, hmm, I've never thought about that, you know, because usually we, we point to, you know, the laboratory where this thing has been repeated, we've tested it, we verified it, you know, we, and, and then you can go, okay, we know this is, this is how it works. So you do the surgery on a cadaver, right? For starters. I mean, you know, the surgeons start, they don't start on the live person, right? They, they're working their, their skill on somebody who's, who's no longer alive. Uh, second set of questions, how will we measure success? That is, how will, how will we know uh, that someone is no longer oppressed? If oppression is the problem that, that is being addressed here, inequity is the problem, how will we measure when we have achieved success? You know, when will, when will we know we've arrived, okay? Is it income uh, levels? Is it participation? People were formerly excluded, now they participate. Do we have target participations? And so is it impact on others? You know, so how, you know, so you can um, win something but lose something else, right? And so you're trying to ask that question, what about the impact on others? Or is it just feelings? And, and I, I, this is again, sidebar. For a person of color to have a PhD from an Ivy University, Ivy League University, to be working there and to be publishing and to have their ideas being disseminated into society, is there no bigger win than that? So, but if that person still feels oppressed, well, maybe there's no way we'll ever be able to measure success because if it's all just feelings, those, how do you measure feelings, right? So how will we know if someone is no longer, actually no longer oppressed? So we're kind of, I said, I uh, forget how many days ago, compared to what? You have to be able to measure against something else, some standard uh, to, to know that, you know, you've made, made progress. So that's a, sec a set of questions. And then here's one that's maybe a little, little wonky. How do we know that power is bad and that justice is good? So critical race theory teaches that the systemic oppression of people, this hegemonic power that is controlled by whites, typically the white um, heterosexual male, right? So that, that kind of, that's the pinnacle of the oppressor in the matrix of oppression. How do we know that power is bad? And, and how do we know that justice is good? What, why should we care about these things? Which is to ask, it's another way of asking the question, is there a religious or moral or ethical or philosophical code that stands behind critical race theory. I mean, well, everybody knows that the misuse of power is bad and everybody knows that justice is good. Equality and fairness are good. Everybody knows those things? Well, I guess white people don't, right? I mean, so that's, so what you're trying to do here is, is there a moral, ethical, religious code that stands behind it? Because if people will say, well, well, no, critical race theory is its own self-contained. It's, it comes out of legal studies and, and it, it derives from these teachings of Karl Marx. Okay, great. You know, about oppression and et cetera. Well, well, how do we know that justice is good? And how do we know what justice is? 
let alone that it's good. And, and those are unanswerable questions apart from a moral, ethical, religious code, right? Because apart from a, a, a framework, a higher framework, a higher power, a God, an intelligent design, or you know something uh, kind of uh, classical uh, uh, humanistic idealism, you know, classic humanism believes there's an ideal world, and then you know there are virtues that are reflective of some higher order. Absent that higher order, you're left with Nazi Germany. Might makes right. And it's no coincidence that um, Marxism and Darwin, <laughs> that these were underneath some of the thinking that informed uh, what happened in Nazi Germany, okay? And so this is trying to, this again, this is a little wonky. Um, it's kind of moves in the direction of apologetics, trying to, you know, make a case for God. If there is no God, if critical race theory says, well, we, we're, we don't care about God, we, well, well where, where do we get the idea that sharing and distributing resources is a good thing? I mean, how do we know that? Um, well, because we said so. Oh, so the critical race theorists are the ones who said so. Okay, well, where do they come up with that? And so you're trying to push back to the sources of uh, the thing. Because again, that's not being taught. All that's being taught in our schools is you need to identify your white privilege. Well, why is white privilege a bad thing? There must be some moral code that says white privilege is a bad thing. And so that kind of leads to this last question I've got here. If white supremacy and white privilege are so deeply embedded, if they're so wide and systemic and structural and they're, and they're so deeply ingrained that, that for centuries people have been doing it without even knowing they're doing it, how do you explain white people's willingness to change then? How do you explain this deeply embedded thing <laughs> that pre puts people on top, how do you explain why would somebody want to give that away? Why would anybody want to give away the throne? Why would anyone want to give away the, the treasure chest? If, if white people are so bad, <laughs> then why would they ever choose to divest themselves of power? Well, because they have awakened to their injustice. They've awakened. That's what. That's where the notion, whole notion of being woke comes from. We'll maybe talk about that in the coming days. Well, what does it mean to be awakened to justice? Where does just? How, how do we know that? Ju, how do we know that sharing resources and all people being able to participate in society freely and sharing in all these benefits. I, I don't disagree. I, I affirm, I, I, as a Christian, I affirm uh, a vision for a just society, but, but where does critical race theory derive that from? And if somebody says, well, well, it, it kind of comes out of the Christian worldview, I go, oh, well, the Christian worldview teaches that all people are made in the image of God, and it teaches that all people have sinned. And so what's curious, I'm curious, why does critical race theory only teach that white people have done bad things and, and, and that only white people can experience? And so you're trying to bring some logical inconsistencies to bubble up. I, I hope you're following me. I hope this makes sense. Because you can't have the, the Christian moral framework which says that the misuse of power is bad, okay, and that justice is good, so that's Christianity, right? This is a Christian argument that's being made, but critical race theory wants the fruit of Christianity, but it wants to cut off from the root, which is the belief in God, okay? And so I, I reference back to that um, book I've um, spoken of, Tom Holland's book, Dominion, how Christianity Conquered the World or something is the subtitle, something like that. 
that even notions of justice and human rights and, and civil rights and the protection of, of the marginalized and the poor, all the, these are all thoroughly Christian arguments that our Western society, particularly American society, takes for granted. The, we hold these truths to be self-evident. Well, these are truths that have derived from a source, <laughs> a source of authority that says all men are created in the image of God. Therefore, we say all men are created equal. Because of sin, that's why we have a tri tripartite form of government, and that's why we have an imperfectly lived out constitution, right? We're an imperfect society because we're full of sinners. That's why we have checks and balances built in because our founders knew that there was something corrupt in the human family. Not all were thoroughgoing Christians, but all were um, had embraced this notion. So these questions are trying to get behind to the sources. We assume things that are true which I think they are, but you have to also wrestle with the fact that these are true because there is a God. <laughs> there is a source of authority that teaches us that the misuse of power is bad, that teaches us that all people are equal, that teaches us that, 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 that justice and righteousness and equity are things that God wants for the human family. And so these questions are trying to get at some of those that may create a little bit of doubt uh, within somebody's mind. <clears throat> so a couple other questions that didn't fit on the board here. Uh, just curious, what kind of, of studies or research or evidence do you, that supports your thinking around critical race theory? And if they say, well, I don't need data, just look at history, you know, slavery itself. Okay, so historical data would be the answer to that. Are there other studies that indicate uh, the well-being and progress of the marginalized? Are there any other studies that are indicating, again, this gets back to the measure of success, because studies I've read and seen is that the best place to be for a person of color, the best place to be uh, is in America. This is the most opportunity for income and for freedom, freedom of religion, freedom of thought, uh, freedom uh, for your family. The best place to be is this country, okay? That's why they're trying to get here. <laughs> That's why we're bringing Afghan refugees here, right? <laughs> Let's get them out of Afghanistan. Let's get them into uh, the United States. So, so there's a whole set of questions there. Are, is there an openness to looking at other studies that may indicate things that are contrary to what critical race theory offers? <clears throat> um, another set of questions or another question, if lived experience, as we've talked about, okay, lived experience of the marginalized gives them an authority, gives their voice a, a measure of truth, okay? So, so particularly intersectional lived experience, the, the black gay <laughs> uh, female has more authority because of their lived experience at the intersections of multiple places of oppression. If lived experience bears witness to truth, if it's true for some, then why isn't that true for all? Because if if there is a moral code and it says that all people are created equal, and that's why we have a sense of what justice is, if all people are created equal, then is then why is the lived experience of some more truthful or more authoritative than the lived experience of others? So again, you're just trying to create a seed of doubt going, I hadn't thought about that. Hmm. I have I haven't thought about that. Maybe the answer you you get to that question. And then finally, is there any concerns that the social construction of reality, that is, race is, a, is an invented concept to keep people down, gender is an invented concept to keep people down. So the social construction of reality, is there any concern that the social construction of reality can lead to such experiences like we have in Nazi Germany? then maybe the social construction of reality is maybe itself a concept that we want to examine. Um, so 
they're just some questions um, that, that I think about that, that hopefully are not, uh, I may be asking them a little too aggressively here. <clears throat> and I don't know, you're never going to get a, a conversation where you're going to get all these questions asked, but there might be a, a variety of conversations uh, in weeks and months ahead where one or more of these questions might come in handy. Okay. Again, I think, I think critical race theory is a social phenomenon that is here to stay for a long time. I, I, I hope I'm wrong, but I think it has, it is getting so embedded so quickly in the, in multiple cultural institutions that it's, it is becoming, um, a, a, a new moral framework, a new world view, whereas we've been animated, American society has been informed and animated by the, the, the Judeo-Christian worldview. I, I think what we're seeing is a replacement. And so what, what part of what some of these questions are is to show that actually critical race theory and some of its concerns are actually derived from Christianity. There is no other explanation other than Christianity for uh, the way we think about justice and uh, life and equity and, and these things. So anyway, let's let's close here. Um, hopefully you've, you've listened. Uh, um, and uh, again, welcome anyone who wants to join uh, in this afternoon's um, uh, discussion. We call it the bitter enders. For those who watch to the bitter end, send me an email at dmeeks at greenwichpres.org, dmeeks at greenwichpres.org. I'll send you the Zoom link and we'll just, we'll just keep, keep the conversation going. We, there's a lot of, lot of back and forth uh, for about an hour, hour and 15 minutes. Okay, let's pray. Father, thank you uh, for this opportunity to think out loud with uh, sisters and brothers and friends. Uh, grant that these questions raised and others like them would be fruitful in real conversations to help open eyes and minds and hearts to a broader understanding of, of how to care for one another. Uh, thank you for the challenge that this cultural expression known as critical race theory brings. May we rise to the challenge and be faithful followers of Jesus who shine like stars in the midst of a crooked and depraved generation. Lord, hear our prayer as we make it in Jesus' name, even as he taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. May the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ cause his face and his love to shine upon you this day and forevermore. Amen.